Salutations once again to y'all. Uh, thanks for uh, stopping by. It is McCowan. It is Shannon. Robert. Uh, John. Lovely to see you. I, if I only believed that. Well, why wouldn't you believe that? <laughs> it was said with such sincerity. <laughs> well, you could come on by phone and then I wouldn't have to look at you. But if you're going to be here, I might as well at least, you know, try and compliment you. Yeah. The operative word being try. So uh, a couple of days ago, we um, uh, had on a, a couple of hockey pucks to talk about um, the upcoming NHL trade deadline. You've had time now to think about the things that you said. Would you like to change your mind on anything? No, no, no. I mean, uh, you know, on uh, Tuesday night, uh, Taylor Hall and Kyle Parry didn't uh, didn't dress for their respective clubs, and uh, the clock ticks, and we'll go from there. But nothing, nothing, nothing's changed. It's uh, you know, it, it 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 in talking to people since, uh, I think that. Uh, the consensus is it's going to be slow, um, slow on Monday, and uh, you're going to sit in your chair and giggle at the networks when they uh, try to tap dance for all that time. Um, so this will sound strange, I think. Uh, it, 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 it's strange to me. But I was trying to think back to whether there was ever a time when there wasn't a trade deadline in professional sports. And, and I don't recall that happening. Do you? I, I, well, I... I there always was one in hockey. Um, it was just, believe it or not, it was much later in the season. Uh, and it was much closer to playoffs where teams could, to, could actually adapt uh, their lineups um, within weeks of the Stanley Cup playoffs as opposed right. to, uh, what is it? I guess it's six or seven weeks now. So, But uh, I, there, there always has been. I, I I've paid less attention to it in basketball because I don't think the in previous years, because I, I don't think there's been much happening there and football uh, in football, it's difficult to trade during the season because of, you know, the, the complexity of the playbook uh, baseball, the baseball deadline has had some interest in what is it? There, there's, there's two deadlines, really one between the leagues and one, one in all of major league baseball, right? Um, yes. Uh, the right. second one, which is the end of August, right. is um, uh, you can only trade within your league in the, in the month of August. Right. And why that is now with interleague play and the inevitable appearance of the designated hitter in the National League yeah. um, is a mystery to me. And I and believe. the role and the role really the roles of both leagues. I mean, let's face it. Uh, you know, the, 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 we used to know who the American League and the National League presidents were, and that they had lots of uh, influence. And that's that's certainly not the case now with the Commissioner of Major League Baseball being the the, the the single entity that runs both leagues. So here's a question: Is it still valid that in major professional sports? Um, the champion of one league in the case of baseball or conference in the case of hockey and basketball and the Super Bowl should meet in the championship game. Isn't there a better way to acknowledge that everybody plays everybody, um, albeit not more often, and the significance of having to play in your conference before you get to the championship game or series has lost its relevance? Um, well, no, I, I, well, I actually think the regular season has lost its relevance. Uh, well, I think we all acknowledge that. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying to you, John, that, that why since, since, you know, okay. American league nationally in when we, when you and I were growing up, they never played each other. No. And the two leagues operated as separate entities. Mm -hmm. They had their own presidents. They made their own decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a joint venture. Major League Baseball was kind of the the overseer, but it wasn't. It didn't have control of the two leagues, and so you ne you know it. This the only time you got to see a National League team play an American League team was in the World Series, right? Which made it special. I'll, I I agree, 
but those days are over. Um, interleague play exists. Now, whether it'll mm-hmm. continue to exist is a good question. The style of play is going to change dramatically um, to the American League side because the DH is coming to the National League probably the eventually. Year. Yeah. Well, probably next year. And so what's the significance? Why wouldn't you have the two best teams, however you figure them, meet in the championship rather than insist? And this oh, often happens God. where the two best teams are in the same conference and then wind up playing somebody of lesser quality in the final. Because it's all about money. Well, how is it's how all does about that impact that? Well, because you, you need you need to create a playoff structure in order to do, sell the importance of playoffs to your networks. No, you uh, don't. To sell, well, you you do because uh, the, playoffs the, are the playoffs. Networks. I mean, it doesn't. I don't. Do you think the networks care if it's East versus West in the in the final? If it's National League versus American League, wouldn't you rather have? For the sake of audience, which is what the networks care about, wouldn't you rather just have the two best teams? I'm trying to think of a scenario where that was the case, and I'm sure there are many. Well, I, well, I tell you, do you remember the year that the the Yankees played the Mets in the World Series, and the rate on Fox and the ratings were horrific because there was there was there was no there was, it was only a New York it was a subway Event. series. And yeah. a sub a New York event, and it, and and there wasn't any interest in, you know, the Pacific time zone and the Central time zone, and the Yankees and the Mets. So I I do think there's something to be said for, um, regional representation. I think if you can interest more people across the country in certain ways, um, particularly in the United States, it may be different in our country, but particularly in the United States, I think that there would be there would be there's a, a better chance of a broader interest. Well, that'll work in every sport except baseball because there is no East and West in baseball. Right, right. You have nationally. But teams I t- tell you what, there there are a lot happening. The same with the American League. If if the best teams are Milwaukee and St. Louis, and you have a choice of having the Yankees and the Dodgers, uh, they're choosing the Yankees and the Dodgers. Well, because of geographic points yeah. of difference, and because it's the two biggest markets in America. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think third, that's and your third you're choice trying to fudge Chicago. it. You're trying to fudge the system so that that happens a lot more. Yeah, I mean that's the ideal scenario, but you can't really create that, you know. And I mean, uh, I'm not sure that the argument you're making uh, speaks to the question at hand, which is why not have a scenario where potentially the two best teams meet in the championship? Because that is, that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, it probably happens pretty rarely. I haven't done any research on it. Well, at the Super, at the Super Bowl, at, at the Super Bowl, you know, when it was Tampa and Kansas City, were they the two best teams? Um, they were the Kansas two City teams. would have been. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But Tampa wasn't. No. Tampa played three. Tampa played three road games. NBA before. final last year. Was that the two best teams? Was one of the two best teams? Yeah, that, you can't compare. That was the bubble, though. I don't. Well. Whatever it was, you know, I'm just trying to go with recent history because, yeah, you, know, you remembered back that far. My memory f- fails me. What <laughs> I said, you remembered back that far, did you? Uh, barely. <laughs> well, uh, since I'm not getting any cooperation from you on this subject, um, let's bring in a another friend of ours. Um, he is the uh, longtime voice of the uh, Toronto Raptors and uh, has now for quite a while been the voice of the Chicago Bulls. Chuck Swirsky will uh, join us when we continue after this. For a long time, he was the uh, radio and television uh, voice of the uh, Toronto Raptors, and now with the Chicago Bulls, been there a long time. Here's our pal Chuck Swirsky. Chuckles, how are you? I'm doing well, Bob. Great to hear you. Great to see you. Mr. Shannon, always a pleasure. Chuck, pleasure's ours. Uh, I should also make mention that you were also uh, a host on uh, The Fan in those uh, early days at the same time. In fact, your show led into my show. Yeah, I apologize for that, Bob, but somebody had to do it. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> now you're, you're, you're not doing a, a show on radio on a regular basis anymore, just play-by-play? That's correct. Yep. Uh, miss, the, miss doing the show? Yes, very much so. Um, you know, let me just say this. I, when I was at the fan 590, 
Nelson Millman was like the best guy in the world. I oh, love don't Nelson. Say that. Don't say that. <laughs> Not where his head's going to get big again. Oh, my God. I mean, he had a policy. I could walk into his office, whether it was for 30 seconds, 30 minutes. It was never 30 minutes, but just he was an awesome guy just to deal with. I felt energy. I felt a great vibe. I felt that, you know, he was family. And, you know, you want to bust your tail when you're working with someone like that. It's, it's just not Bob and John working for someone. It's working with someone. And there's a difference. Well said. And um, hopefully he's, uh, he's watching or listening uh, today. Um, I know he does. On a, he's actually been a guest on this program on a couple of occasions. Uh, we got into a conversation, Shannon and I, about um, something I'm, I'm interested in your take on it. The relative merit of East-West finals in sports today. And, you know, you also have to include National League versus American League for the World Series. Because everybody plays everybody, not with the same regularity we understand. Because geography is the only point of separation. Does it make sense as we see more and more changes, as we're going through this COVID thing, which has created all kinds of potential changes, does it make sense to re-examine championships in such a way so that the two best teams wind up playing regardless of where they are? Excellent question. Bob, in my generation, okay, I'm a baby boomer. There was a suspense, even detailing uh, the elements of an all-star game, the American League against the National League. We never saw Tom Seaver pitch to Al Kaline. That's and right. all of a sudden, we're seeing the best of the American League, the best of the National League. The only time these two teams in the league saw each other was spring training when you were playing B games in Sarasota, Florida at two in the afternoon with about six guys that were going to make the roster. So now all of a sudden, we see a blend and we're seeing these players you know, change teams almost every other year. And so as a fan now in 2021, to me, there is no dichotomy. Everything, it's just, everything is in the pool and let's just play games and it doesn't matter what's going on. We're having interleague baseball on September the 18th and wow. So in my opinion, especially with charter and the days off between games, let's just get the two best teams and let them go. I'm with you. Well, and I, you know, we were talking about um, historic references to situations where the two best teams arguably did not play. And with due respect, I would say the NBA final last year was one of those scenarios. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember. It Miami was, and the Miami and the Lakers, right? Well, yep. it's Miami and the Lakers. And I mean, the Lakers clearly were the, the cream of the crop and they wound up winning the thing anyway. I'm trying to think of who would have been the obvious second choice. It might even have been the Clippers. Yeah, whether it was the Clippers, whether it was Houston, truth of the matter is that I think if, if this is what it's all about <laughs> from a competitive standpoint and to have the fan become more engaged in the month of June, when the weather is changing and the thoughts not necessarily on an indoor event and all of a sudden you've got the two best teams to me, that's worth watching. And so, yeah, on a Wednesday night uh, on June the 12th, I might be inclined to say, you know what? LeBron is taking on James Harden in the NBA finals. I'm going to, I'm going to check it out. Well, um, I don't think anybody's contemplating this. I think we are the only ones probably talking about it, but um... Uh, I think it's a, um, it's a, it's it's worth looking at. I don't think they're going to, but I think it's worth looking at. Well, I, and I think one of the, but the, the biggest issue is you're, what everybody's trying to do is and try to ensure that there's value for everybody who, who's invested in championships for the most for the biggest audience, and and that becomes the challenge. And that's, I mean, that's why we've gone to playoff formats. That's why it's not just you know the the team that wins. The, the most in 162 games in one league plays the team that wins 162 in the other, and they just, they just meet for seven games. They're trying to create more interest across more cities for more fans and more television eyeballs. That's, that's what they're trying to do. I, I don't, and, and I think when you listen to 
you know, the Stanley Cup playoffs and the NBA playoffs, they're two months long now. They're two months. It's not as if it's, we're going to play for another four weeks and have a champion. You're playing almost, uh, you, you know, a third of the third of the length of the regular season now to find out a champion because but, but why the people necessity? want people want to be more involved in that. John, why the necessity to play within your conference until you get to the final? I mean, it's just well, a, it's I, a theoretical thing. It, it it isn't based on anything. They divide the leagues up into conferences based on on geography, essentially, except for baseball. Geography has nothing to do with it in baseball. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, the one thing it's, I would say, and Chuck, you you should jump in here. It's it's be, because there has to, you have to create some relevance for the regular season, and regional rivalries drive regional rivalries drive the regular season. I get that, no. but but John, at the end of the day, and, and I understand where people are coming from, saying, "Well, in the first round, you could have a Toronto Clipper matchup, and these teams are going back and forth and back oh, and forth." But you, you don't know want what? that. Well, how about them reseed? Fine. You know what? Stay within your conference for the first maybe two rounds and then reseed because by that mm-hmm. time you've got the have and the have nots. I, I, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like yeah. that. The, the other one, the other one, the other one, and I know it's been contemplated uh, in a couple of leagues is, is, is you cross over in the conference finals. So you, you end up with those four teams that are, you know, the final four and East one plays West two and East and West one plays East two. Well, I don't under, you know, I mean, why not just reseed uh, based on uh, performance on, um, on regular season performance? Um, mm-hmm. I don't think you have to be more complicated than, uh, than that in any event. Uh, this Chicago Bulls team is an interesting team. They are uh, on the cusp of the playoffs. And I say that because, well, they're 10th right now in this goofy year where now 10 plays nine. Is that right? And then yeah. the plays the, the seven, eight one. Yeah, the uh, the play-in game. They did this last year in the bubble, and it continued to this season. You like it? it well, uh, I'll, I'll say this. why The reason why I do like it is there's interest and engagement for a lot of these teams in the last month of the season. Mm-hmm. And I think for a lot of clubs, it means revenue. It means fan interest. And I'm all for that. Now, having said that, if I'm a coach – and I'm scratching and clawing to get my team in the playoffs in the regular season, and I'm the seventh seed, and it's been a grind, and all of a sudden say, oh, by the way, you're going to host an 8-7 game, and the loser has to play the winner of 9-10, and and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, <laughs> I just won the regular season seventh seed, and now I got to, you know, if I fall in the first game, I mean, so it's it's an imbalance, but I understand it. And I get it, and it's revenue producing. So one hand feeds the other. Well, my argument to the coaches uh, bitching and complaining about being uh, the number uh, uh, seven seed is: well, you should have played a little better during the regular season and finished sixth. Then you wouldn't have to worry about it. Thank you. Yeah, just trying to be logical here. True. Uh, What's that? <laughs> whatever. Uh, the Bulls. Um, have stubbed their toe the last little while. They seem to have recovered from that. They made the big trade at the at the deadline. Were you surprised with the um, the uh, the Vucevic acquisition? Well, I I was surprised from this point of view, Bob. I didn't think Orlando was ready at this point at this point to make a major move involving Vooch. Aaron Gordon, yes. Fournier, yes. Vooch who was a foundation piece to this organization. And you can say this, you put Shaq and Penny in one category. If you look at the volume of players that have passed through Orlando. I know it's staggering, isn't it? Yeah. Vucevic left an indelible mark on that club. I mean, his rookie year was with Philadelphia, came over to Orlando. Everyone's saying, who is this guy? And he turned out to be Paul Gasol times two. So when I look at the acquisition of Vooch at the timing of the deal, Bob, 
and what the Bulls surrendered. I mean, this man is an all-star player in his prime. These players are hard to come by in their prime. We're not talking about a guy that's 33, 34 on his way out the door that has a couple years left on his contract and he's playing it out. We're talking about a man in his prime, a 2010 player every night. So Mm -hmm. when you say, well, you gave up a couple of the number ones, I really don't care. You know, Wendell Carter Jr. has an upside. I get that. But in order to get something, and I hate to sound like cliche, but I am, you got to give up something. And the jury's still out on Wendell, what type of player he is, and will he become a Vucevic? I don't know. Only time will tell. But when you get a chance to acquire a Vucevic, you got to go for it, especially when they have Levine. And so, so, and how 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 has that changed the Bulls? And where where do you do you get a sense this team is has a have a, has a different prospectus now? Well, it's been seven games, John. So the 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 optics are this: he is a he's a very high IQ player, doesn't force a lot of shots, uh, runs an exceptional pick and roll. I don't want to get too technical here, but he reminds me so much of Pau Gasol and Jokic, where they can roll to the rim, they can mm-hmm. shoot threes, uh, they facilitate an offense at the top of the key, and they make other players around him better. And to me, that speaks volumes about a player. And that was one of my big criticisms of Carmelo Anthony. Incredible score. Is he going to the Hall of Fame? Absolutely. 100% lock. At the end of the day, did he make his teammates better? No. Okay. So you've got a guy like Jokic. You've got a guy like Vooch. And to me, those type of players, Bob and John, make other players around them better. Now, you have to surround them with highly skilled players. You just can't surround them with journeyman type players and say, okay, now you're going to be a really good player or an all star player. It doesn't work that way. But if you give them uh, an accompaniment of really good players, then they're going to go from a 42-win season to 49 or 51. And that's what really, really good players do to aid uh, their teammates. You know, it's interesting. I, and I confess this. When I saw the deal made, I thought, well, why would, you know, why would Chicago do this? Um, they're not really ready, I didn't think, Um for Vucevic, I didn't think that they were they could look at themselves as being a championship caliber team. And then I, as I rethought about it, I realized you probably this is a deal you just couldn't pass up, regardless of where you are in the standings and reg- regardless of of what's going on in your season. Do you think this was a deal that the Bulls um, pursued, or a deal that just kind of <laughs> fell in their lap and they said, well? Under these circumstances, why wouldn't we? Well, I think Orlando is going in another direction, a new direction. Again. Again. Um, And, I mean, they made significant trades. When you get rid of a Vucevic, a Gordon, and a Fournier, uh, all swooping in, and all of a sudden you look at their roster now, I mean, they're in for the long haul. And this is a major, major rebuild. Probably Oklahoma City right now, Bob and John, and Orlando have the two biggest rebuilds facing any NBA team. But in answer to your question, for the Bulls, if you look at the post-Jordan era, the rebuild post-Jordan did not go well. No. The Bulls were very fortunate to get Rose in the lottery. They, they were picked to have 10% chance of getting the number one overall pick, and they got it in 2008 and Rose was the youngest MVP in the league, Bob and John at 22 years young had just turned 22 Mm -hmm. and everything's going great. We got a healthy Joakim Noah, Luel Dang, Derek Rose. I mean, this, this club was loaded and ready to take on LeBron and the heat Rose goes down with an ACL, never the same player at that level ever again. And so now the bulls are saying, Wow, where do we go from here? And in the meantime, the market is very competitive. You have not one but two major league teams. You got the Chicago Bears. You had the Chicago Blackhawks in the midst of winning not one, not two, but three Stanley Cups. And now the Bulls are looking around saying, hey, where are we in this market? 
This is a great sports market, as both of you know. And so now we have a new administration coming in. We have a new coaching staff coming in. And I'm telling you right now, this new management team, uh, Arturis Karnaschovas and Mark Eversley, who obviously was with the Raptors in Nike Canada, they're all business. And you know what? They, are, they made a major, bold move by getting Vooch. Well, and um, on the other side of the coin, the Orlando Magic remind me of the San Diego Padres. Um, uh-huh. uh, you know, two, two organizations that just keep trading away players who wind up being impactful in other organizations. The Padres did it for two decades or more, including a couple of guys um, to the Blue Jays who were pretty significant in um, Joe Carter and uh, Robbie Alomar. Mm-hmm. And um, this Orlando Magic team, as you mentioned, Chuck, you take a look at the guys who have gone through there. And I understand the circumstances were, were different in, in a lot of those cases. But boy, they have gone through more rebuilds than, than I think any other franchise in the NBA. And yep. here they are again. And you know what, Bob? They were, they were at a point, John, as well, that they, they were tired of being the eighth seed or trying to knock on the door for the seventh seed. And they're looking around. Fournier's a free agent. Aaron Gordon wanted out. And you got Vooch. And he was the guy that was going to bring in the big haul. And mm-hmm. so I think they decided, and I really like John Hammond and Jeff Weltman. And Jeff, of course, was with the Raps. And uh, John Hammond did a fantastic job with the Bucks and Pistons. I think they got to a point where they said, hey, listen, this isn't working. Let's just you know, have a blank canvas and go from there. The, the interesting thing about the – you talked about the Chicago market, Chuck, um, because, there, you know, and while you were in Toronto, let's face it, the Bulls, the Bulls were still a dominant force in the market. Um, and and it, it did shift when the Blackhawks became the winter sport of choice. Uh, but the Bulls, the Bulls fan base is still huge. Yes. And the Bulls, Bulls fan base is and, – and, I mean, how, how impatient were they when all this was going on? How much, how much passion was in the market? When they, because the, 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 one, the biggest difference in my mind between hockey and basketball, and you, you know that, I think you know this, is that basketball fans, when they're mad, they don't show up. <laughs> hockey fans still show up. And, and, so, and in that a cavernous building, the United Center, you would, you would notice when the fans are mad at you. Yes. About, well, about play. Here, here's this is just my opinion. The last thing an organization wants is the fan base to be apathetic when they don't care. If people are upset and mad and angry, that at least tells me there's passion in the tank. Um, but when people say, you know what, we really we're not we're not feeling it, and they they tune out, that that's a huge worrisome mindset for an ownership group and management. And I think and once, once when Rose went down, I think the Bulls fan base gave the front office the benefit of the doubt to see what they can do over a two year span. After that period, then the fans said, what's going on? And I think our ownership, Jerry and Michael Reinsdorf recognized that. And that's why they made a, a, a major move to bring in a brand new front office and a coaching staff. One of the things, I mean, there's a lot of things that drive me crazy. Um, one of the things that, that I, I still don't understand is this, this notion that players need rest and that you give players days off. Um, when we were all coming up in this business, we never saw that. We didn't experience that. Um, play, you play, players played. Are there more games now than there were then? Probably. Um, but not significantly more. I mean, I think we go back to, you know, 70 game seasons as opposed to 80 game seasons, but now you see players rested all the time. Um, do you like it? Do you think it is, it has actual value source? Well, think about this, Bob, also back in the day that they flew commercial. That means they had to get up at 6 AM to fly out of the city, whether to return home yep. or to go to another game on a back to back or they, they took the train or they took the train. They didn't have nutritionists. They God, didn't you guys are old. Conditions. You guys are I old. Hey, listen, you're, you're right. Hey, listen, 
Yeah, that's what they did back in the Philly, Boston days, sure. uh, New York. But the thing is, Bill Wennington is my broadcast partner, Canadian Basketball Hall of Fame, 15 years as a pro ball player. And his mindset is that once the season ended, the players rested. They didn't have to get back in the gym to work out with the developmental coaches like three weeks after the season. They didn't pick up a ball until August. I mean, you know, they were on the golf course or they were just being, you know, dad around the house running, you know, to-do lists or taking a vacation or just hanging out with the guys and having a beverage, watching a ball game, you know, on, on TV. And so now these guys all of a sudden are sweating. They're in the gym and, and it, it, that's you know, all well and good, but I think these bodies need rest. I really do, Bob. So now all of a sudden you're getting the regular season and some of these players who are unbelievable athletes, great, great athletes, they're breaking down and you wonder mm-hmm. why. And I, th- I think it's a serious concern of the NBA. I really do. Well, um, you know, we can have a long argument about that. Get rid of the training camp then. They don't need training camp. Because they're always in shape. They're in shape already anyway. Well, um, the National well, Football yeah. League, for, for unrelated reasons, is reducing their preseason to three games, but they're adding another one under the regular season. So that you, it tells you what that's all about. It's about economics. Uh, we got to take the break. Chuck Swirsky is with us. We'll come back after this message. With the uh, current voice of the Chicago Bulls, the uh, former of the uh, Toronto Raptors, Chuck Swirsky is with us. You're in Chicago, are you not? Yes, I am. And uh, for those that are listening on radio or listening to this uh, as a podcast, Swirsky is featuring a green uh, Ohio University Bobcats um, shirt. And of course, is trying to pawn off the fact that uh, it has some reference to my nickname. Of course, it has nothing to do with that. He is an alumnus of that university and uh, proudly features it. But I did know I was coming on your, your podcast today, so I wanted a little connection tie in there. Well, I just want you to take a look <laughs> over my shoulder. There. Yeah, I, I oh, see that. You can see the uh, the Buckeyes logo on the wall there. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Just, you guys, you guys, so you okay. Know. Okay. We all, we all know that, you know, the state of Ohio has wonderful universities now. Okay, fantastic. Hey, did I ever tell you my story with Woody Hayes? Oh, I got one too, but go ahead. I love to hear this. <laughs> so I, I, this is 1979 and uh, it's in Columbus, Ohio. And I see Woody Hayes. And remember, this is just after, okay, the Gator Bowl uh, game. Oh, with, the incident? Yes, this is months after. And so Earl Bruce has been named head coach to replace Woody Hayes. Earl Bruce had came in from Iowa State. Right. And a former assistant under Woody's at Ohio State. And so I, I approached Woody. I said, Coach, I don't want to ask you anything about football. Just want to introduce myself. I want to say hello. And uh, so all of a sudden, within five minutes, he starts talking about the Marshall Plan. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, am I back at school taking a history about World War II, about you know Eastern Europe and you know reconstructing you know the continent and and so? But he he was in he was really in to history. I mean, he could teach a class on history. He probably did at one point at Ohio State or sorry, the Ohio State University. Thank you very much. Uh, my quick story is I called. Um, Ohio State in the 70s, I guess it was, and uh, to do an interview. I wanted to do an interview with with Coach Hayes. And uh, the um, AD um, or Sports SID, Information Director. Yeah. Yeah. The SID put me through to the coach. And I got this gruff hello on the other end. I said, Coach, my name is Bob Baba. And I did a very quick this, blah, blah, blah. And I, I wonder if you've got, uh, we'll have some time uh, to chat. And the next thing I heard was dial tone. And that was, that was my conversation with Woody Hayes. So he, he obviously liked you a lot better than well, he liked you. You know what? It was in passing. So I don't want to embellish the story, but, okay. but, it, but he was really, he was really into history. And uh, yeah. the, the bears had a wide receiver who played under Woody uh, by the name of Brian Bashnagel. Of course. And, I remember him. Yeah. And, and uh, 48. 
Uh, Brian was from, I believe, the Pittsburgh area, if I'm not mistaken, played high school ball in that area. But he loved Woody Hayes, like loved him big time. And all these players that went through Columbus, like idolized Woody Hayes. And, you know, then later, right before I went to Toronto, I was doing play-by-play at Michigan. I was doing their basketball games, did pre f and post for football. And every Friday, I would see Bo Schembechler because he his office was right next to Lloyd Carr's and the individual who preceded Lloyd Carr, Gary Moeller. And so I would stop in and talk to Bo every Friday, every Friday. Well, and true. yeah, oh my gosh, I would, I have so many Bo, Bo was awesome, like awesome. And he loved Woody. He, I mean, you know, because you know, the, the battle of Michigan, oh yeah. my gosh. And so just to hear these stories and to hear about two men who like ate it, lived it, breathed it, Michigan, Ohio State. And when, you know, when Bo left to go to become the head coach at the University of Michigan from Miami of Ohio, which was the cradle of coaches that produced Woody Hayes as well. I mean, it was fierce. It was competitive. And there was a time where they really didn't communicate until later when both were, you know, out of the mix. But anyway. Hey, hey you bring up the, 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 your time with around the Wolverines. The, oh, the level of, and I, I want to use the word property, the level of professionalism in college sports in the United States. You know, the, living in Canada, I don't think a lot of us really understand that. Uh, we, we watch it, but gauge the difference between uh, being with an NBA team and being around uh, the Wolverines basketball team is how, uh, how much different is there? Unbelievable. That is a great question, John. So I did play by play for DePaul for 14 years. DePaul. Ray is Meyer. A, yes. Ray Meyer was my analyst. In fact, after he got done coaching a hall of fame coach, he was a tremendous person as well. But then I went from Chicago to WJR in Detroit. And the lure was the University of Michigan. Big time program. Big time. And I won't name the school or the individual, but my first year doing games at Michigan, this is in a conference game, basketball game, Bob. And before the game, I went to introduce myself to the announcer because DePaul really didn't have a series with many Big Ten teams, Northwestern, maybe on occasion, you know, Wisconsin and Minnesota, but that was it. So this is all brand new to me. And I go in to introduce myself and this announcer like blew me off. He wouldn't shake my hand. And I'm thinking like, what's up with that? And so I later found out that you have to take on the persona of the university. And if there's a rivalry, if they don't like Michigan or any other school in the big 10, they become almost like a player or coach. And they, wait a minute, I'm not playing. I'm calling a game. Do I want Michigan to win? Absolutely. But that's not going to shade how I view what, what I'm about to call. I mean, I have to have integrity of the broadcast. So that's the intensity of what it's like in the United States regarding collegiate athletics. You can say all what you want about the NCAA, and we could spend thousands of weeks on that. But from the intensity and passion standpoint, especially college football, oh my gosh. I mean, the world stops for three and a half hours if your school is playing on a Saturday afternoon. And the bigger the conference and the, the, and the importance of the game, then you don't get in the way on that window especially in college and in the NFL, by the way, because the NFL people are diehard fans. So, but now it's not a fair comparison because Wolverine football was massive yes. and the lions and the Detroit lions were brutal. Correct. Uh, so it was always difficult to measure, but was there was never a comparison. Was there, I mean, between the Wolverines and the lions? Well, during the period I was there for, I was there only four years, Sean, but I mean, when you draw 115,000 a game at the big house, I think that speaks volumes and that probably says it all regarding the, the love that Michigan fans have 
for the University of Michigan and Michigan State, you know, really turned the corner. Uh, and, you know, Michigan's taken a little bit of a, of a hit now because Harbaugh hasn't been able to win those games against the Spartans and the Buckeyes. And so, I mean, a lot of people are impatient. Uh, some people felt that maybe Harbaugh had coached his last game during the COVID season, but he got renewed. He got extended. And it's not like Jim Harbaugh forgot to coach. He's a really good coach, but he hasn't won games against Ohio State, but, Michigan State. It's not about coaching. It's about recruiting. You know that. Well, it is, but it, it's more than that, too. Both. Yeah, it is. It's about both. And, and, you know, the really intriguing thing, just to kind of wrap up this, this, this conversation, is the uniqueness of that the fan bases for college sports teams, given that virtually all of them are in small towns or small cities. There are, yep. um, you know, UCLA, USC in LA, um, Northwestern in Chicago. I mean, there's a handful in big cities, but the big schools are all in relatively small. Ann Arbor is, you know, and, and Lansing is not, not a big place. And Columbus for years had under a million population. It's grown. Um, and we can go down the list. Uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, hey, it's a small town. You know, Bob, Bob uh, for the uh, last couple of years, I've taught for a week at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi. The chair of the Department of Communications is from Chicago, he used to write for the Tribune, Chicago Tribune. So I've gone to Oxford to teach. The level of passion and intensity Ole Miss has for football. And it dates back to the legendary coach, John Vaught, Archie Manning. And I mean, and I mean, it's like. And how big is Oxford? Oh, just 20,000. Yeah. 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 Like that's the, that's the whole point. Um, That, that level of passion has nothing to do with, with really geography or population base. If you, if you went to the school, if you are a fan of the school, you will be forever. Correct. Or, yeah. And, yeah. and to prove that out, for those of you that are watching this program, uh, Chuck Swirsky is sitting there as an alma mater of uh, the University of Ohio and wearing uh, uh, yep. his sweatshirt. And I've got the Buckeyes logo on the wall behind me. So there you go. There so you we're, go. We're, we're unfortunately out of time, but um, we loved having you on. We're so glad Thank you, you took us some time for us. And hopefully we'll have a chance to chat more. Yep. in the not too distant future, and uh, we'll get into some other things that we didn't touch on today. Thanks, Bob. Maybe even talk Thank about you. your time in talk about your time in Toronto, Chuck. Yeah, maybe even talk we, about that. We'll get. Well, to we it. can always do that. Yep. Be well, guys. Thank you, Chuck okay. Swirsky. We'll be back after this. Bob McCown, John uh, Shannon, to uh, wrap it up. Uh, nice to touch base with uh, Swirsky again. Used to see him every single day of the week. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those, he, he, I, I want to know how he he he's starting to look younger and you and i well you are looking older excuse me <laughs> yeah. well you're you know in this lockdown bob you're just not you know you're you know you're not, you got to go out for a walk every once in a while there's nothing outside that i want to see <laughs> I, I've, I've seen it all <laughs> i gotta move to a new neighborhood where there's more interesting things to see well, lots of good neighborhoods. So. No, but I mean, Swirsky and I used to sit and talk every day. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't shut them up. Uh, no, you actually, you just used to listen. So, well, he, I know no, he knows no short stories, and he has tons of them. And uh, yeah, uh, he was um, he was there for a long time. But we'll get into basketball the next time we chat with him. Well, we Raptors Bulls tonight, right? Ra- Ra- Raptors Raptors Bulls tonight. So. Well, yeah, and a game that is. Um, this is actually maybe the first game this year where you could say it matters looking at the standings. Oh yeah. Uh, there are a couple of games back of Chicago, I think. And the Chicago's 10th, the Raptors are 11th. If it finishes that way, the bulls get into the postseason and the Raptors don't. So it's a game that matters for both teams. And uh, it may be the only game that the Raptors play all year that actually has that designation of mattering. Uh, if they lose this one, um, it probably will be. But then again, who knows? Um, but our thanks to uh, Mr. Uh, Swirsky for uh, joining us on the program. 
Uh, are you coming back from Edmonton some point soon? Sometime soon. You're just not going to tell us? No. We, well, I'm not sure when yet. So, you know, they're... Oh, really? It's one of those? Well, the, 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 well, the schedule, the NHL schedule is changing. I mean, you know, oh. there's, you know, the game was supposed to be Friday. Now it's tonight. Well, so there's, things are happening all the time. We, we, we this COVID complication. Uh, we will uh, bid you a fun to do uh, and uh, wrap up the week uh, tomorrow. Hope you're back uh, for that. Thanks very much. We'll see you.